people, I'm Isaac Carlson, and on Following Dreams, I'm focused on exploring the stories of people who are following their passions and achieving their dreams. I want to help inspire you to pursue what you love by hearing how others have done it. But before we welcome our guest for today, be sure to take part in all of the magical places on the internet that I live. You can find all my discussions on the wonderful world of Disney on my YouTube channel, Watso Videos. Be sure to follow my adventures on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Watso Videos. Consider supporting the show by telling others about the show, joining my Discord, and becoming a producer of this over at patreon.com slash Videos, and getting the following dreams merchandise at watsostore.com. Feel free to send me a comment or question at followingdreamspodcast at gmail.com. And if you enjoy what this show is doing, be sure to rate us over on iTunes. Today's guest is a man who has currently spent over 25 years at the Walt Disney Company. From roles as a story artist on Tarzan, Zootopia, and Frozen, to supervising the story on films like The Emperor's New Groove and Brother Bear, to even directing projects like Winnie the Pooh and Meet the Robinsons, he has established himself as both an artist and a leader at this legendary studio. While right now you can see his contributions to the world of animation come to life in Frozen 2, pretty soon his time as a supervising director will be showcased in his involvement with Monsters at Work, which is a Monsters Inc. series coming to Disney Plus in 2021. Welcome, Steve Anderson. Hey, thank you very much. Nice to be here. Thanks, Isaac. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you here, especially with your your long amount of time at Walt Disney Company. It's so cool to be able to speak to you today. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's an, it's an honor. I really appreciate it. And I can't believe I've been there as long as I have. I can't <laughs> believe it's been almost 25 years. <laughs> Oh man, I can believe it. It it feels like even when you do something for like a few years, like five years, it feels like a super long time. So I can't imagine what it's been like. You've seen so much go on at the studio over your tenure. So it's it's yeah. incredible what you've been able to do. Yeah. It, well, it's funny because I remember when I started, I was 25. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, at the time, the comp- the the uh, company you had to sign a contract to work at the company and it was a standard like three-year contract and i remember signing that contract as much as i definitely wanted to work at disney but there was something about signing a contract that as a 25 year old i was like oh man i'm being shackled to a it just felt very constrictive and i, I remember thinking oh my gosh three-year contract i'm gonna be 28 when i when i finish this contract i'm gonna be like my whole life's gonna be over <laughs> and now cut to 25 years later and uh my life is not over. It didn't end after mm-hmm. those three years. <laughs> yes. Suddenly, when you turn 30, things don't just suddenly start to degrade or anything. You can keep going and doing no. things. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes, you know, when you're younger, you, you think, that, you know, it's your whole life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You just don't realize how <laughs> really long life is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So right away, I want to ask you, what are you passionate about? What have you? What gets you super excited about everything that you've been able to work on? I think what I really, the reason why I do this is I love getting some kind of emotional response from a viewer, an audience, whoever it might be with the work that I do. And I remember when I was a kid, constantly drawing, but part of the process for me was to draw something and then do the rounds at my house and like show the drawing to my mom and then show it to my dad and show it to my sister. And I think I, I I wanted to get a response. And I think that's, that, that was why I I did that. I didn't realize it at the time. Now, you know, cut to all these years later, what, what really makes it all worth it is when, you know, people say I had some kind of emotional reaction to something you did. It could just, it could be a laugh. It could be a smile. It could be, even to, I didn't really like what you did. I mean, there's all the whole <laughs> spectrum, but, but I think, I think that's really what it, that's what's special about what we do to me is that, is that what we do creates an emotional response in people. And that's, that's really satisfying. Mm-hmm. That you want something to connect with people in some specific yes. way. Yeah. That... Yes, Exactly. Oh, that's really. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I can't remember the. Oh, I can't remember who it was. I think it was when I was at CalArts. Somewhere, somehow, someone told me a quote from 
some artist, and I don't remember what type of artist, but Mm -hmm. some kind of creative person who said that essentially all artists are looking for that kind of emotional connection and emotional response. Otherwise, we would all just, you know, do our artwork at home and then stick in the closet and just go about our lives. But we don't do that. We exhibit it somehow. We, you know, put on a play or we make a movie or we sing a song or we post something on Instagram or whatever it might be. Like we, we, that's all part of the process is you do something that you're really excited about and then you want to share it with people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think, I think that's, I would think that I, I, I believe that's probably pretty much everybody who's in this business uh, would agree with that on some level, I think. Mm-hmm. That it's the kind of the idea of you, you want the affirmation of others and kind of being able to reach people and, and have that type of, yeah, I guess deep connection with them, building an audience yeah. of people who respect the work that you're doing and that it yeah, actually exactly. means something. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. That's really cool to hear you talk about. From a very young age, you were taken by the Disney style, which led you to have an interest in drawing. What films, shows, and characters did you really latch on to when you were growing up? What made you fall in love with animation and film and got you into this initially? I'm trying to remember if there was a specific movie. Uh, I feel like my first memory of just movie going in general was seeing Snow White and Seven Dwarfs at a drive-in movie theater. Mm. We, my parents took a, took my sister and I to drive-ins a lot. Uh, I seem to remember thinking that the people that were doing the voices for the for the characters were standing behind the screen with microphones and they were just like talking into them and the and the voices were coming out and matching the <laughs> images. It's sort of one of my earliest memories of that. But it was really Disney in general, which ultimately led to uh, Looney Tunes and tons of Hanna-Barbera cartoons and Filmation cartoons and, you know, tons of cartoons. Just loved all cartoons. But definitely Disney was the thing that piqued my interest and made me want to draw. Um, and I don't <laughs> – I've often tried to figure out what was it about – what was it about it that that sparked me to 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 want to go home and draw – I don't really know what it is. I mean, I there's such an appeal to Disney characters. I think I think the eyes, the face, uh, just that appeal that uh, Disney character designs have were uh, was very uh, enticing to me. I think I liked the fluidity, the squash and stretch, which I later you know, I didn't know what the term for it was, but later when I when I got Frank and Ellie's book, I learned what that was but that kind of pliability to Disney animation that not all animation had, certainly not a lot of TV animation that was being made at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, The colors of Disney animation, there's just something very rich and satisfying about that. I don't know. We're rambling a little bit, but just in general, that aesthetic, and maybe it's because it was just there because we, my, my parents took us to see Disney movies pretty much. That was our diet until, Star Wars was my first PG rated animated movie up till then. It was only G movies. So that basically meant Disney movies. Mm-hmm. Um, so it might've just been because it was there. And I, cause I just, you know, I just I, I kind of connected to it somehow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's that type of like nostalgia for the things that you are surrounded with when you grow up and Disney definitely has a feeling of, fantasy with all of its work at least a lot of it's with its best work is it's this Mm -hmm. type of uh experience into another world which definitely is exhibited as well with star wars i i'm also a huge star wars fan (laughs) so i i could definitely see the parallels with that yeah yeah so once you got into drawing and everything that eventually I learned about you culminated in seeing animators tour while they were searching for more artists and you got to go and meet Eric Larson, one of Walt Disney's nine mm. old men. Could you talk about what was so significant about this moment for you? Yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, it was a, it was a uh, college. There was a, the, this was, wow, shoot, was it 81, I think? And this Disney Studios uh, were kind of going through their post-Walt 
70s and 80s identity crisis around this time, and they were trying to really um, trying to evangelize to the world that it's you know that the studio was changing, and they're trying to attract younger talent, and it's not your grandfather's Disney Studios anymore. So they launched this big college program, uh, college tour rather, and uh, they had. I think it was two groups that traveled to different colleges uh, over the throughout the country and gave these presentations. And so I came to school and one of my teachers said they knew that I was I was a Disney fan and I liked to draw and they showed me this I think it was an article about it and so I ran home that night and uh, ambushed my dad <laughs> as soon as he walked in the door from work and was like can we go to this can we go to this and luckily, I had extremely supportive uh, and patient parents, and so my dad uh, took me into uh, to Philadelphia uh, at um, Penn College, and uh, we went to see that program. And yeah, Eric Larson, I think both groups had a nine old man. I think one, the other group was Wooly Reitherman, I believe, and then I got Eric Larson. And it was very not too long before that, that illusion of life had come out. And so um, I was learning about who these people were. So it was significant to meet Eric because he was one of these guys. Like I had just learned that there was this concept of the nine old men and there were these, you know, these were the, these were sort of the trusted uh, um, colleagues of, of Walt and they were kind of the leaders of, of the animation studio uh, so to meet one of them was just, was really cool. Um, I took, I, what I, I brought some drawings with me and they were, they were all just copies of Disney characters. Cause I thought, Oh, he'll think that's cool. And mm-hmm. of course, uh, he did. And one, I'll always remember a good line. And I thought, wow, I put down a good line. I just always remembered that. Like Eric Larson told me I put down a good line, but then he, he said, this is great that you draw Disney characters, but I really encourage you to draw your own, come up with your own characters, draw your own stuff. And he, and, and that really did kind of, that was a turning point for me because up till then I really did essentially just copy cartoon characters, Disney characters in particular, but then any other characters I thought were appealing out of comic books or, or books or anything, I would just copy the characters uh, and that was sort of very significant to me. And I do recall that changing my, the way I approached my drawing, um, after that. And then fast forwarding to, you know, now getting to talk to, uh, and work alongside a lot of the, the, these animators that work, that, that were trained by Eric and that worked with him has made that memory even more, uh, significant because, now I really realize how what an impact that man had on the future of Disney, the future of animation in general. And so to think that I got to cross paths, and even very briefly, but I got a chance to, you know, shake his hand and he looked at my drawings and said I put down a good line. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> That he was able to help steer you down a path where you would be able to impact the studio in your own way and keep moving everything forward. (laughs) That's really incredible. Mm Kind of weird. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And it's just those, those sudden moments where things really begin to take shape, at least in retrospect that you suddenly realize that that was a big moment uh, for you and for your career. What were the yeah. changes that you made to drawing as you continued to get older, as you got into high school and started thinking about moving on to go become an animator? How, how did you practice? Just, I just drew constantly, just, uh, always drew, I kept a sketchbook and, uh, just drew whatever I, I loved that because of, because of, and also just sort of where my, my, I think where my interests eventually t- took me, but because of what Eric had said and, and just, you know, in general, how I was evolving, I did start drawing my own characters, creating stories and characters and stuff like that. But there was sort of a general frustration. I enjoyed drawing, but a lot of times I would look at my drawings and then let's say flip through the pages of Illusion of Life and look at those animator drawings and think something is missing. I don't know why I'm not getting, obviously, 
years and years of experience I didn't have. Um, that was the difference between myself and the animators and that work was in that book. But I was like, what do I have to do? I didn't really understand. I didn't understand how I could get closer to that. And it really wasn't until I got to Cal Arts and I took life drawing class that I realized, okay, that's, that's a huge key ingredient of what I was missing because life drawing, I really started, I was, I think what I was doing before was I was just basically drawing lines and shapes, but I wasn't drawing forms. Uh, and so life drawing really got my head into how the forms are fitting together, how you construct a human figure. And, and then I could start applying that to the cartoons I was drawing. And suddenly the cartoons became uh, more dimensional and just the drawings became a little more solid. I still don't think I'm a, I still think I have a weird amalgam of like 2D, um, like, uh, or I should say graphic quirks in my drawings also mm -hmm. coupled with a little more dimensional drawings. I don't think I'm like a, a really fully dimensional artist, like a, you know, like some of these animators that just draw really beautifully and solid, solid construction, and all that. But I think I've gotten better at it. And I think that life drawing was really the thing that made me made things change for me. You know, I was, mm -hmm. I was now seeing, pardon me. I was now seeing the cartoons I was drawing as not just, flat cart flat drawings just the graphics of lines and shapes but now seeing those dimensional forms and trying to actually um that you could you could have both but just because it was a cartoon it didn't mean it couldn't have it couldn't be solid it couldn't have anatomy um it was just a caricature of that stuff mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah that you wanted to actually embed some of the more humanistic qualities to it so it made it feel more real even though it was clearly a cartoon yeah yeah exactly mm -hmm. it just made it feel more yeah more believable <laughs> Pardon sure. me, I'm sorry oh that's made okay me, it made it feel more believable as like a as a character i guess mm -hmm. so how did you make the dis how did you make the de Ugh, oh my goodness how did you make the decision <laughs> to eventually go to California Institute of the Arts and what was the process like to get accepted um, I so we uh, <clears throat> uh, we were uh, our family was a member of the Magic Kingdom Club which was the like the 70s equivalent of what's now the Disney Vacation Club the DVC thing that uh, that they have at the parks Um and with our membership came this a subscription to this magazine called Disney News, which was like the day, whatever, wh whenever the day was that I would come home from school and the mail was there and the, the, the new issue of Disney News was there, that was like the greatest day in the world. Because <clears throat> I just lived for this magazine and it was everything about the company at the time. It was parks, it was movies, it was animation, all that kind of stuff. And one particular issue I opened up and here's this article about this school where they're teaching animation. And up until that point, I was getting, you know, it was a couple of years before I was, I was going to graduate high school, trying to think ahead, figuring out, okay, what are you going to study? I want to get into animation, but how do you do that? I have no idea. Uh, I was thinking, you know, and my, I don't think my parents would ever let me do it like a general fine arts major because that just seemed, my dad was very much like, you got to have something that you can make a living with because, because I think he was, he was much more of a practical person and not necessarily a, uh, he was very supportive of me artistically, but not, not an artistic mind himself. And so I think he thought that what I was pursuing really had no future and that I couldn't make a living doing that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so he started thinking about, well, maybe I sh could study architecture. I guess, you know, something that's sort of artistic, but, but you can have a career, um, at doing but then lo and behold here's this article about the school in california and there's all these pictures of these young young kids basically animating and the article says that this is a program that teaches you how to animate and it's a school that's you know supported by the disney studios and i was like oh my gosh that's i uh, there's no choice there's no other choice i have to go to this school like, this is it. This is the answer. So uh, my folks were very supportive of it as well because they knew that this was really the thing that 
I was passionate about and I had been dreaming about for so long is to be in the animation industry and maybe someday work for Disney. So, um, so I applied. Luckily, I got in. I would have just kept applying every year if I hadn't gotten in because, again, there really was no other option in my head because mm-hmm. this, is, this is the late 80s. There was not – there was very few, I think, maybe Sheridan College up in Canada had their animation program. There was CalArts. Maybe there was one or two others, but it wasn't like now where so many – Schools have animation programs now. Even high schools have animation programs. Um, so that was that was it for me. And uh, luckily, I, I put together a bunch of my cartoons. And I did have a little bit of what I would call life drawing, but not really life drawing. But one of my art classes, we did have a model come in, and uh, we did do a little bit of a little bit of drawing, but it wasn't like heavy duty life drawing yet, but I had some of that stuff and just assembled everything I could and sent it off. And, and man, I was so happy when I got that acceptance <laughs> letter. I was just, I was just so thrilled. Oh, I believe it. Everything started to <laughs> come together with that. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> so it was over your summers when you started to go to Cal arts where you got the chance to begin to work as an animator, what did you begin to notice was different between the academic setting and the professional world? Yeah, I think it was just the accelerated learning that happened on the job. I, mm. I certainly learned a ton at Cal Arts, but when I started working, I, I remember feeling like, man, it's like somebody just stepped on the gas. And, I, and because you're doing it every, like you're doing it every day in a very controlled environment, you've got deadlines and you know, people are looking towards you to, to perform. You just, the learning, like in three months of, of a summer, I felt like I learned as much as one of a full year of animation classes at Cal Arts. And that's not to undersell my animation classes because I had great classes and great teachers, but, um, but just nothing beats on the job learning, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that was really the biggest thing I noticed was just that, that pace, the, the, the pace of learning was so much more accelerated. Yeah, that there is suddenly a much or like kind of bigger stakes when you're on the job and trying to execute for this this more like robust situation instead of having the the homework and the assignments and things like that. Yeah, I I can just imagine it's when you actually have to apply what you've been working on for so long in, yeah, as you were saying, the controlled environment where things really start to ramp up. Was that an exciting ramp up or was it, was it very difficult to get used to? Oh, it was super exciting. I was, I was great. I was so uh, happy to be doing what I was doing and, and work alongside these amazing artists and, and, yeah, it was it was great. Um, obviously, there's pressure and a certain amount of intimidation <laughs> because it's like, all right, you, here you are. You better, <laughs> you got to do it now. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was, you know, but but never was it um, negative in any way. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, from my perspective, I, I just was really excited to be there. So could you talk about what your experiences were like before you joined Disney and how those helped you once you got into Walt Disney animation? Yeah. Sorry. I have, I have not had a frog in my throat all morning. And of course, now (laughs) that I start talking to you on the phone, I'm doing this. So I really apologize. It's no problem. Um, (laughs) um, yeah, well, so I worked at a, um, the first job I had out here in, in California was for a studio called Hyperion Animation, which was run by a man named Tom Wilhite, who I later found out used to run, basically run motion pictures at Disney uh, in the in the early 80s. Um, very significant in kind of turning around the, the studio at that time. He was responsible for Tron. He was responsible for movies like Never Cry Wolf. He was responsible for Touchstone Pictures and Splash, all that stuff. Anyways, that's just a little tangent. Um, but uh, because it was a smaller studio, I was able to do a lot of different things. 
So I felt like that was a real interesting, like I, I sort of got the general lay of the land on just about everything. I started as an animating assistant. I Then I became an animator. Uh, then they stopped doing feature animation stuff and they got into TV, television series. So I started storyboarding for the first time on one of the TV series. One of the directors left and they, uh, thankfully for Tom Wilhite, I don't know why he decided to do this and what he saw in me that he thought I would be able to do this, but he said, do you want to direct because there's a spot open now and um, you can be one of the two directors on this ser series. So I jumped at that. So I got to direct um, before I was, or like when I was like 23, which was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the way they ran their TV was much more like a feature. So the director was, was doing everything. The director was overseeing all the artists, but then also timing every episode. We directed all the actors. We, uh, went with our episodes all the way through post all every step of the way. So that was like a great crash course in directing for animation. What's the general process of how you put something together, which when I then eventually started directing at features many years later, I felt like other than creative issue, I mean, there's always going to be, there's always going to be challenges and obstacles and stuff like that. But for the most part, the process itself was not foreign to me and did not seem scary. So I could be scared by all sorts of other, other things, <laughs> <clears throat> but, um, but like being in a room with an actor or being on a stage at a, at a sound mix or, or, um, you know, working with animators or working with story artists, storyboard artists, that kind of stuff, all of that, was something I had done already and I was familiar with. So my my years at Hyperion were crucial because I, I felt like I learned animation from all sides. And I, I, I'm always eternally grateful to Tom Wilhite for uh, taking the chance on me. Because you had this love for Disney, for animation, you had consumed it so much, and now you had a bit of experience with the process after schooling and you were able to touch yeah. it all, which is something yeah. that if you can understand a lot of parts of a, a system, it makes it a lot easier to be a specialized person in one aspect of it. And I'm sure that also helped set you up to eventually get more opportunities to grow because of all of this experience that you previously had outside of the studios. Yeah. And, 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 to be able to say I, I had had leadership experience prior to Disney was very helpful as well because, you know, that that helped me. I mean, obviously I had to prove myself at, at, at the studio and at, at Disney Studios and everything to to advance. But knowing them knowing that I had had previous leadership experience, I'd led a team before and and, and you know led a team through the process was, I think, helpful for, for them to trust me. So when you eventually joined at Disney, you came on to Tarzan, which I've heard you describe was a great first experience where there was a lot of collaboration. What was the situation mm -hmm. that brought you to get your opportunity to move to Disney? And what stuck out about working on Tarzan for you? Mm. Well, uh, the other thing that was great about Hyperion was that there were a lot of pretty significant artists that came through that studio. So I got to meet uh, many big name talents that I eventually would end up working with and for and all that in the future. But I was able to, to, to make, you know, start building some relationships there. And um, one of the person, one of the people who I met there was Kevin Lima, who ended up being one of the directors on Tarzan. Um, he was, he had come to Hyperion to uh, develop and direct uh, a feature and I became friends with him and we started working together and he let me do a lot of things on that, on that film. He let me do some, um, some like visual development kind of concept stuff. He even gave me a sequence to storyboard at one point. 
so I, I got along really well with Kevin. He left Hyperion to go do the Goofy movie, but because of that connection, um, when he when he went from Goofy movie to Tarzan, he invited me to, to come on over and be part of that. Also, the other director was Chris Buck, who was my animation teacher at Cal Arts, who I got along with very well and who was always very supportive of me. So because I knew both of those guys, they were very gracious in inviting me to come on over and, and be part of that film. And as far as significance, I mean, I had a massive learning curve on Tarzan. I was on Tarzan for about three years. I look at drawings that I did when I first started, and then I look at drawings that I did as I was right, right at the end of that project, and the difference is huge to me. I can see so much change uh, in the way I drew. I can see confidence being built. I can see um, just drawing improving, acting improving, um, all that kind of stuff. It was extremely intimidating for me when I started at Disney um, because it was Disney. And not only that, I was I was there. What I always assumed I would have gone to Disney for was animation. And I would have done the usual thing of starting, you know, as a, an in-betweener and work my way up if I was ever going to be accepted there. But since I had kind of made this move into being more interested in story, I was there as a story artist. And that, to me, was really special. But also, like, I, I don't know. I don't know how to do this. I had done storyboarding at Hyperion, but that was all TV storyboarding, so it was much different. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had some, I had, and, and you don't, you didn't, we didn't pitch our storyboards at Hyperion. You just, you might, you might walk through it with your director or whoever, but that was it. So there was also this whole process of, of getting up in front of everybody. And this was the old days of, of uh, pitch sticks and, mm -hmm push pins and uh, you know, getting up there and doing the whole traditional old school pitching, um, which I was terrified of having to do. So all of it was like, it was, it was the most exciting thing, but it was also one of the most terrifying things I think I'd ever experienced up to that point. But it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me as an artist, but then also just as a person because on Tarzan, but also, you know, continuing being in the story department for years after that, the confidence just in myself that I was able to build was really huge. And I think it, I really do ascribe it all to being a story artist and having to pitch and having to participate in the room and having to brainstorm with people and collaborate that I had never had that kind of intense collaboration before. Um, I was very much an isolated kind of like I like to do my own thing. I'd like to show people, but it's kind of like I, I I would sort of want the work to speak for itself. I didn't I didn't want to have to get up in front of you know twenty people and do a song and dance about my artwork. I just want to <laughs> I just want to do a drawing and like hold it up and let people see it. Um, so sorry, rambling a little bit, but um, there was a it was so significant to me in in all ways just like all ways of myself and all parts of myself but particularly those first three years on tarzan in the disney story department there was just a huge amount of growth that uh that i was able to uh experience it was really cool sure yeah you got the opportunity to forge your own path at Disney and you were forced to kind of stand out and go into a more uncomfortable place than you had previously because you were involved with television and then you were able to, you know, grow and thrive, which must have been such an exciting experience. You were finally getting to be in the place where you had set out to go and then yeah. you moved on to Kingdom of the Sun, which was a film that went through a pretty dynamic meltdown and shift to become <laughs> the Emperor's New Groove. I did a video yeah. all about that crazy schedule and yeah. everything that happened with it. it. It's just, it's insane to look back on. What was it like yeah. being there when all of that chaos was happening and how did you eventually become the head of story? Uh, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was a really... Um strange and at times uncomfortable time. 
uh, just because there was, you know, you were, we were seeing a lot of people that we really liked go through a lot of, of uh, turmoil on their movies, and it was not fun to see, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the funny thing was, so I had, as I uh, probably, I don't know, the last six, eight months or so on Tarzan, as everybody does, they start looking ahead to, well, what project would I like to work on, and what would I like to do after this movie? And there was this movie being developed. It was a Western. It was being developed by Mike Gabriel and Mike Giamo. <clears throat> and it was called Sweating Bullets. And I was, the, the Mike, Mike Gabriel, both of them had done all this amazing concept art and that had been hanging in the halls for, for, for quite a while. And all of us were just in love with it. It was so neat. And we thought, oh, to make a, a full on animated Western would be so cool because Mike Gabriel had done all these really neat, cowboy drawings and and like gunslingers and that type of stuff and i thought oh, i really want to work on that movie and i had um i had gone in and and talked with uh mike gabriel and mike giamo i knew mike giamo from cal arts also he was my character design teacher uh there um and i talked to them and they were, seemed very receptive to me coming and work on the movie and i felt like I could have been wrong, but I felt like I was sensing the possibility to become a head of story on that movie. So I was really excited about that. I rolled off of Tarzan and I was like, I'm ready to go on to 20 bullets. But they said, we need you to come help out on kingdom of the sun uh, to get us to a screening. So I went and I did some boards for that screening, which was the screening (laughs) where everything melted down. (laughs) Um, so I was like, oh, gee, well, I'm really sorry about that. But so I'll just take this opportunity to go work on Sweating Bullets. And they were like, no, 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 we need you to hang around on, on Kingdom a little bit. So then they went through this really uncomfortable period at the, uh, sorry, quick backing up for a beat. So Roger Allers, the director of Lion King, was the one who originated the project Kingdom of the Sun. It was his baby. And he was the primary director, Mark Dindal had come on to this uh, on to kingdom as uh, Rogers partner director when that when the screening melted down they did a really weird thing where they split Mark and Roger off and they each had two teams of artists and they said Roger go you go and and come up with a version of your movie that that's better that addresses all these notes and issues that we have with it and Mark you go over here and come up with whatever you want, just any other kind of alternate idea. Just come up with another take on on this world, on these characters, whatever you want. It was really weird to kind of be pitting director against director. Mm-hmm. And I had a weird, I had the weird um, job of actually being on both of their teams. So I was jumping back and forth doing drawings for each of their pitches and sitting in rooms for each of them. And it was really awkward. And all the while I'm like, can I just go work on sweating bullets? I just (laughs) really want to go work on sweating bullets. And then uh, Roger and Mark pitched their respective versions to the leadership. They chose Mark's version, which was this weird comedic take, which is what became members in the groove. And, when that happened the producer called me up and said we'd like to offer you the head of story job on that on kingdom excuse me on emperor's of groove which was called that at the time and so i thought well i should probably take this opportunity (laughs) and so i did and i don't regret it uh at all um because sweating bullets went through its own issues because that movie became home on the range which which i think is a fun the movie itself is really fun but the process of getting a movie out from that original concept was like there were so many iterations and so much turmoil on that project that I'm actually glad that I missed that (laughs) (laughs) yeah uh yeah I can't I can't imagine going through those year-long commitments and then having them all completely change in a matter of hours that that just sounds absolutely brutal to deal with especially when they're the emperor's new groove turned out to be a a very fun it was a it was a cool movie to see it had a lot of charm yzma was a fun villain so it was it turned out 
turned out great in the end. But then the project I've heard you talk about that you were the most proud of was the feature where you made your directorial debut, which was Meet the Robinsons. Could yeah. you talk about why this film meant so much to you and what led up to you becoming the director after rising to head of story? Yeah, well, um, the, how I got there was um, I had always been interested in directing, and this is like a, a bit of a rewind back to pre Cal Arts days, even that uh, um, as much as I wanted to be an animator, I started getting more interested or, or equally interested in screenwriting and storytelling and I started learning what a director was and what they do and I read this uh, at the time the big screenwriting book was by an, uh, a man named Sid Field and it was called Screenplay and it was like the first or, or, or it was at the time sort of the, the current buzz Hollywood buzz um, thing like I'm not articulating that really well uh, but, but so Sid Field the way he broke down screenwriting and, and structure and all that kind of stuff was like really becoming a standard for the, for the industry. So I read, I started getting really interested in, in the bigger picture stuff in, in big story concepts. And, and then also because I'd, I had, I had, I had done leadership roles in Boy Scouts and in school and things like that. And I did like doing that. Uh, so all this stuff was sort of gelling in my head um, and I, I started that started getting becoming a little more interesting to me, even than being an animator was was leading the team and getting involved in more of the story construction and themes and character arcs and all that kind of stuff. So I did come to Disney with like maybe someday I could do that here. I'm not going to count my chickens yet, but with an eye, I just always had kind of had an eye towards that. So then uh, they trusted me with the leadership role on Empress and Groove as had a story. After that, I had said, hey, I'd really like to be a director someday. I'd like to be considered to do that to, uh, f for that role. And the studio said at the time, great, we hear that. That sounds really good. We'd like you to do another movie first as a head of story. And so that was Brother Bear. Um, and I moved to Florida, the Orlando studio for uh, about a year and a half ish and did that. That gave them confidence in my leadership ability, having done two uh, heads of story tours of duty. So then they uh, gave, I, there was, I, I started uh, just on the side developing uh, one project that they already had in development. Uh, that ended up not going anywhere, and then they handed me the script for another project, and it was called A Day with Wilbur Robinson, and it was based on this book by William Joyce, and uh, it was the full script. They said, "We'd like to. Would you consider doing this uh, as a director, or at least start to develop it?" And as I read it, it was like a home run to me because it was a story about a uh, an orphan boy who was looking to be adopted and wondering about his past and, and who his birth mother was and why she gave him up. And I was adopted. So while I wasn't an orphan, you know, in that particular of the character, um, I had for so long had those same questions about where I came from. And I had all, I had, I had wondered that in my head and, and thought about that a lot and I really got this kid I totally understood this kid so and, and it was a complete coincidence that the studio happened to give me that script they had no idea that I was adopted so I, I came back after reading it and I and I explained it to a um, person running development at the time her name is Pam Coates and I explained it and I was like you don't understand I mean this is the perfect movie for me to do um, I completely get it. So I took it and, and, uh, four and a half years later we had a movie. Um, so it was super significant from that emotional standpoint, from that, you know, connection to the material that I had. And then obviously it was also significant because, Hey, I was directing a feature film at Disney. I mean, that was like, what, how, how, what, how, you know, could get any better than that. Um, so I was, uh, 
I was really uh, honored to be given the the opportunity. Yeah, you were able to get the reins on a, a full feature film project. It was the it was the final pinnacle of everything that you had been working on up until that point, and it turned out to be a very enjoyable film. I remember watching a lot on DVD and getting a lot of enjoyment from it. And oh, the the end was really always resonated with me. The inspirational story of keep moving forward and everything. I, I really enjoyed the film and oh, I good. realized, you. Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs> but when I was doing research into interviewing you today, I didn't realize that you were one of the, well, a few of the voices in the movie. You were Bowler Hat <laughs> Guy, Grandpa Bud, and Cousin Tula- Tulaha. I, I believe that's how you say it. But uh, Tallulah. Tallulah. There it is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how did that happen? How did you cast yourself in this role? <laughs> you know, it sounds so egocentric, and it really wasn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, oh, you know, it's similar to the way Chris Sanders. Uh, is Stitch in Lilo and Stitch. Mm-hmm. Having directed that movie, Brad Bird is is Edna Mode in Incredibles. We we uh, when we we storyboard our movies and then we make these um, what we call story reels out of our storyboards. And this is how we kind of workshop our movies at in, in features. So um, you take all the story panels and you you time them out and you take uh existing music and you use it as a temp track and you put temp sound effects and of course you have to do temp dialogue so usually that temp dialogue we don't pay people to come in and do that it's usually just us in the building and we call it scratch so it's our we we do scratch dialogue and uh so i happened to do the scratch for those characters just because i had an idea for i kind of had an idea for what they would be as as we were developing it and as the story artists we were all writing it and and storyboarding it together and as they were pitching it you know kind of voices started appearing in all of our of all of our minds we started hearing them speak certain ways so we all did scratch for it and then i happened to do those characters and then it's just one of those things that stuck and that's (laughs) it's really that simple um we did go through a process of of uh trying to cast other actors um, in fact, we brought in several people for both Tallulah and, uh, grandpa, but, um, nothing really came to be with those, uh, possibilities. So just ended up sticking with my scratch mm-hmm. and there's several other, I, I think all of the, every story artist, our head of story, Don Hall, who ended up, um, being the director on Big Hero 6 and Moana uh he was had a story on meet the robinsons and he's a bunch of voices and then we had three other story artists they're all voices in the movie <laughs> so we did all kind of keep uh, and a lot of it was they had done the, the the scratch voice temp voice and it just stuck mm-hmm. and some of the roles were small enough that it was like well rather than you know the, uh, no big a- big name actors want to want to is going to want to come in and do like six lines of a, in a, of a part. So we might as well keep what we have that works and we'll just use that even though it's not a professional actor. Sure. So that's kind of how that happened. And it turned out great. I I think you were able to really nail a lot of the comedic moments and there was, there was a lot of fun. Yeah, of course. But one of the big story elements of that movie that I just felt like I had to ask you about was Lewis's mother. Was there ever mm. a point in the development of the story where the audience would have ever learned who Lewis's mother was? No, uh, there was a there was a scene where you almost saw her face. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was. I won't be able to remember the complete specifics, but um, most of the through most of the versions, the ending was different and Wilbur did not take Lewis back to the steps of the orphanage. I forget the, the exact course of events, but really the, the climax of the movie was back at the science fair and Lewis puts on the memory scanner and he brings up the image of his mom 
And so it, the camera is in the crib, in his crib looking up. And we see the backlit figure of his mom looking over the bars at him. And just when you think you're about to see who she is, he turns off the memory scanner. And everybody's oh. like, what are you doing? You could have almost, you know, obviously, blah, blah, blah. You could have seen your mother. And he's like, I realize I don't need to see her because I have my family. So it's it's essentially the same beat as the steps of the orphanage. It's just uh, it wasn't it wasn't actually physically. He wasn't physically there where he could reach out and touch her. Mm-hmm. Um, it was more on the screen of the memory scanner. But at any rate, we never were going to reveal, and and I mean, a lot of people would say, "Well, do you know who his mom is, or do you know what she looks like?" Or, and I, my answer was always, "Well, if Lewis decided he didn't need to know, then I don't need to know. So I really don't know who she mm-hmm. would be, and um, so I don't really have an answer for that. But we were never going to, there was never going to be any reveal of her or or um, reconnection." between she or Lewis or any of that stuff. Yeah. It was, the point was to move Lewis forward into his life exactly. and not look back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That yep. makes sense. So <laughs> what was it like to see the completed version of meet the Robinsons at the premiere? What was that experience like for you? It was rather euphoric. Uh, it was extremely exciting. Uh, super weird. Cause because they don't really tell you what is well. My family and guests and stuff that I brought with me, um, we had limos taking us to the uh, El Capitan here in Hollywood for the premiere, and got out of the limo and they really didn't know what I was supposed to do. None of us really knew where we were supposed <laughs> to go, but there's all these people like waving pictures and shouting. Okay, sorry. So the, a quick. The, the one thing that I remember sticking out of my head, and I hopefully this doesn't sound like a real narcissistic memory, but <laughs> but I got out and we were sort of like trying to figure out what to do and all, and all these people on this other side of these this um, these uh, dividers were like going Stephen Stephen Steve 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 I'm like what hi <laughs> and I think I remember just like hi just sort of waving like who what's going on. And then one of the, I think one of the Disney people came up and found us and were like, tell us what to do. And they said, oh, they want you to go over there and sign stuff. It's like, oh. And they, and so they all had, they all had like photos of Bowler Hat Guy and some of the other characters. And, and they just, I just signed a bunch of stuff and it was really bizarre. And that's all. <laughs> that's the old, that's all the memory. But I just remember that being super surreal. I had no idea why these people were screaming at me, and it was that. Anyways, so, um, but the real memory of the of the premiere was just everybody was. It was so nice to, I mean, so lucky with the voice actors, the music folks that we had on the film. Everybody was just so nice and collaborative and supportive of the movie. It just was a great experience. And it was so nice to be able to share it with all of them and just, I don't know, it was just a, it's just a happy, lovely time and everybody felt really good. And I was just very special. The most special thing though was sitting next to my parents in the theater, sitting right next to my mom, uh, watching the film. And, and it was very special and, uh, very emotional. I think both of us, um, but it was really cool. And I got to introduce my parents to Tom Selleck. I think they're very, they were very <laughs> excited about that because we, we watch Magnum all the time. We were, we were card carrying members of the Magnum PI frequent watcher club. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that, that sounds incredible to have experienced. I like hearing that just like, I can't even imagine having your parents sit next to you while watching that whole film about a character going through accepting his family as the, yeah. his true family. That just sounds so, so emotional <laughs> to experience. That's super cool to hear you talk about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was really, it was really neat. And, and I had, 
I had uh, some cousins and aunts and uncles that were out as well. So it was a nice, big, warm family time. Obviously, my son and my wife as well. And, you know, it was just really, it was really cool. It was super cool. So after you had your first feature experience as a director, you assisted with some other great films like Bolt and Tangled. But eventually you were asked to help bring a new age for Winnie the Pooh. Could you talk about <laughs> yeah. how you were brought on to direct Winnie the Pooh? Yeah, I was in. Uh, I was developing new stuff. I was the uh, as soon as Robinsons was over, um, I just went back into development and uh, was doing that. I think I had I had a pitch of a couple projects to John Lasseter at the time, uh, but then very soon after that, he called me into his office and told me all about this initiative that Bob Iger wanted to um, take on company-wide to bring Winnie the Pooh back to prominence. And and at the, uh, up until that point, or, or at that point, Pooh, and it's all lovely work and there's nothing I don't, nothing against anything that was done, but Pooh had sort of been younged way down to where it was, you know, essentially like as far as consumer products goes, it was just stuff for your nursery, for your baby, basically. It was all really young young products and then a Disney junior show at the, at the time. So Iger wanted to kind of bring Winnie the Pooh back to being something that's a little more all ages that everybody can relate to and that can uh, appeal to uh, a, a wider section of the audience. And he wanted to lead that charge by a, a feature, the theatrical feature done by uh, Walt Disney Animation Studios. So John asked me if I would be part of it. He had also asked Don Hall, uh, my good friend and colleague from many, many years prior to that, uh, if he would want to uh, direct, because Don had just finished his second head of story job, first being Robinson's, second being Princess and the Frog. So he was sort of on that trajectory also to advance into being a director. So uh, so I said, heck yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. And Don said the same thing. And uh, so then we were off to figure out what what in the world we were going to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> how did you decide to develop this project? I've heard you talk about how you wanted to add a lot of humor to the story to make it feel more engaging for more audiences. What was your thought process going into creating that film? We, yeah, we wanted to try to figure out how do you... It was a really interesting challenge because by... Nature, Winnie the Pooh, is gentle and um, innocent. The, the world, the characters, Pooh himself, um, very sweet, very charming. Not huge stakes in the world <laughs> of the Hundred Acre Wood. Um, we always said like the the problems of the Hundred Acre Wood have to be something that a you know a eight-year-old kid can come in and solve at the end christopher robin that's that's basically how they all pretty much uh resolve so um and so we want to preserve all that because that's what that's what it means to be winnie the pooh in both the milne books and uh the disney uh shorts however it needs to live in at the time you know 2011 uh, so how what's the balance like how can you make it quote unquote contemporary without uh making it you know poo with the hat on backwards and like rapping poo or something that was the <laughs> worst that was the worst we could think of we always made jokes and obviously we're never gonna do that but but like what he could really go wrong <laughs> that way um so how can you make how can we make it relatable and relevant to today's audiences but also um keep it pure to what we all know it to be and that we all want it to be. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like, yeah, humor was really the big, like if you're laughing, then, then you're relating to it. So if we could make people laugh, all ages laugh at these characters, then, then it's going to be relatable. And we often, like the more we worked with the characters, started really realizing how they're each kind of, they're, they're almost like they're each a facet of the human condition. <laughs> um, 
but just like it's like a human being split in eight parts because you've got <laughs> You know, you've got the optimist with Winnie the Pooh, and you've got the or the innocent with Winnie the Pooh. You've got the pessimist with Eeyore. You've got uh, fear with Piglet. You've got control or the, the 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 desire to control things with Rabbit. You've got the ego with Owl. You've got individualism with Tigger. I'm the only one. That kind of stuff. Like, so they're actually all very relatable, and everybody throughout you know, the course of a day, let's say, are, you are one of those characters at, at, at some point in your, <laughs> in your day, you know, because so, so we realize they're, they're actually really relatable on a core human, you know, foundational level. Uh, so if we can just tap into that and, and kind of embrace that and put that stuff on screen so that people can recognize the humanity of those characters and relate to that, then we should be good. So that's really what we were trying to do. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, that, that absolutely does. Mm -hmm. Trying to reach people by looking at who these characters, characters were fundamentally. Yeah. You had the interesting experience of directing both a computer animated film and a traditionally animated film. How did those yeah. two processes differ? And what was it also like developing a completely new story versus an iconic world that already existed? Well, the, the second question first, uh, it was really great. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a unique experience on Pooh because typically all of our movies that features are blank slates blank piece of paper and you have to create everything we we kind of pinched ourselves for the first couple of months of the project it's like oh my gosh we have a world that exists already we have characters that exist we know how they speak we know how they behave we know how they relate with each other we can just start working <laughs> you can just start <laughs> drawing you can just start like what would happen if, like you could just throw out scenarios and 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 ideas would just immediately um begin forming you know if, let's pit these two characters to, together what would happen if they got stuck in a pit or what would happen if they got whatever and and that was such a unique and uh unusual experience for us at features to um have something that already existed so it was really cool uh and it was just really fun because again you could just start working and and you didn't have to spend you know years and years of which is fine that's also great uh but that can get very tedious uh you know starting from scratch so um it's rewarding when you when you can crack it but uh this was really cool to have the opposite uh end of the spectrum and uh and the difference between the two uh i i tend to i think this I think this analogy works and I hope it won't be sound too pretentious, but uh, it feels to me like CG animation is like, is a little more like photography versus hand-drawn animation, which is like painting. So you're capture. let's say you, you want to capture a landscape. You can take a photo of it and depending on you as the photographer and as the, let's say artist, how you decide to light it and compose it and and where you decide to put the camera, low angle, high angle, whatever, wait for a certain time of day. You there's an interpretation there that you're that you're making with that landscape, but you're doing it through means that are a much more um, a, an accurate representation of what you're seeing versus the same landscape, a painter comes out and puts a canvas down and grabs their paints and starts painting well there's much more interpretation there um and there's a much there's a there's uh you know there's there's you're starting with something that doesn't exist and you are looking at something and interpreting it with your hand with a brush with paint uh both are equally valid but they just yield different results the, the the first one, the photography example, yields a more accurate um, representation of the world that you're trying to capture, which is CG, whereas 
the other one is much more of a of an interpretation, which is 2D, in mm-hmm. my opinion. Does that make any sense whatsoever? Yeah. With computer <laughs> animation, there's so many tools and you can add so many layers of details, which can be really effective to generate very unique, massive worlds. But there's a much more stylized approach when it comes yeah. to animation that is much more identifiable with a company or with a with a studio more so than animation with computers people don't get confused of whether something is dreamworks or pixar when it is related to disney 2d animation there's a much larger distinction with that so i think that makes a lot of sense yeah i think one is one one is replicating reality much more accurately the other one is a is a caricature of reality is an interpretation of reality mm-hmm. um now that's not to say that you can, i mean you can now a days you can do really super cartoony uh more graphic stuff in cg it's not to say that you can't do that or that it's limited but that's but in the world of features feature animation american studio hollywood feature animation and particularly disney the CG animation is going to fall much more on the, on the uh, replicating reality side of things for the mm-hmm. most part in, in, in textures, in lighting, in, um, you know, realizing the world of that particular story, it, you know, it's going to, it's going to fall more into the realism side. Yeah. Disney hasn't committed to using computer animation for a feature to be much more stylized. They've done it with their right. short circuits so far, yes. but it yeah. hasn't been applied for a full feature, but hopefully right. that'll eventually come soon. Cause I would be very excited to see that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. It would be, and, and I get it. I know that oftentimes the, the concern is that, well, the more stylized you get, well, the question ends up being, the more stylized we get, do we does our movie become more specified in terms of the audience it can relate to? Is it mm. become less of a general audience movie? And that the feeling tends to be if it's if it's a much more kind of open Disney feel, it invites everyone in versus something that's a little more of a specific take, which may push some people away but draw others to it. Oh man. You know, that... something like 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 Phantasm Mr. Fox was when that movie came out we were all just over the moon for it and and we were like why can't this be a Disney movie like this is a the story itself like this could be a Disney movie but the feeling was that it was too it was too specified like the way it's told the look of it doesn't uh may limit its appeal to a broader audience and mm-hmm. that's what we have to do at Disney we have to reach if possible everybody yeah so. That that makes sense. Yeah, Miss Fantastic Mr. Fox was definitely it had a completely different tone than a lot of yeah. other animated films. So I I can understand that it sounds like such a difficult balancing act to to deal with when you're investing yeah. in creating these films. But uh, I think there's a time and a place to do experimentation and stylization depending on what stories are being created. And so hopefully when there'll be a story someday that aligns perfectly for a unique 2d style or more comic style for, uh, an animated feature film at Disney studios. Yeah. Well, and, and I think a lot of us are crossing our fingers that now with streaming and particularly with Disney plus, um, is this a way that we can experiment a little bit more within the Disney thing? Uh, as far as style, as far as types of stories we tell, and there's less at stake because you're not sending it out into, you know, how many ever thousands of theaters and needing to make, you know, a hundred million in three days to recoup your costs or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's different with Disney plus. So may, hopefully that could be a, a venue for a little more experimentation, but we'll see, see how it goes. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be very interesting to see how they handle projects like that. I know 
even with animated shows on Disney Channel, if they don't succeed in the in the short term when they start airing, then they they don't become a very high priority on the network anymore and they don't become very supported. I've been seeing that with yeah. Tangled the series, which is difficult, but hopefully there'll be a lot more freedom when it comes to a streaming platform like that, where things can gain and gain momentum over time with the, the releases and things like that. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, You've worked with many legendary animators on all of these projects, and you have even had some experiences teaching the next generation of artists as well. How does it feel to be making an impact on the legacy of Walt Disney Studios and animation? Uh, well, when you put it that way, it's pretty intimidating. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I mean, I think it's funny because when you're, I don't know, I... I don't always look at it that way. Uh, I don't know. It's interesting. I, I think I tend to just, I try to just do the best work I can do on whatever I'm working with and then try to help people as much as I can. You know, it's either through, if it's either, you know, either through uh, teaching at Cal Arts or any kind of mentoring that I've done, um, just try to help people, um, uh, have, you know, trust themselves, trust their own instincts. Um, I guess I don't always think about it in terms of the long term. Mm -hmm. It's more of, well, what's the, what's, what are we doing today? What are we doing right now while we're making a movie? Okay, well, let's make that movie the best we can. Or, okay, I'm, I'm sitting down with somebody looking at their storyboards and they're coming to me for help. So I'm just thinking about it in the moment. Like, how can I help them? Uh, articulate what they want to say with their storyboards clearer simpler um, uh, yeah so that's why I guess that's why I was saying it was a little intimidating to think about it that way because I, I think I tend to not look at this look at it as like oh this is somehow part of a greater thing mm -hmm. it's always a little weird when I do yeah so, sorry rambling a little bit but th <laughs> there are those times where there'll be some kind of, uh, I don't know, let's say like a, a YouTube compilation of Disney scenes from Disney movies or uh, some image that like collects all the characters together and, and you look and there's the characters that you've worked on. And, and that's always a little weird, especially when they're juxtaposed with all these other characters from years and years and from my childhood and from before I was born and, and, uh, and, and that's, that's always like, wow, that's, that's when you realize you're part of uh, that bigger thing. But, but in a weird way too, it, it feels like there's been, even though there has only been one Disney animation studio, it's like there've been many Disney animation studios, depending on the mm -hmm. era, depending on who's in charge, depending on the people <clears throat> like the Disney animation studio that I'm working, that I've worked for. Well, the Disney animation studios that I started with is different than the Disney animation studios that I left last year when I moved over to TV animation. And the Disney animation studios that I started with in 95 is very different from, you know, years before that, uh, when Glenn Keane and John Lasseter and John Musker and all those guys were coming into the studio for the first time right out of Cal Arts, which is different from when Walt was running it. Like, it's almost like there's been different studios within the within the uh um arc of the studio as a whole if that makes sense well i don't i totally mm -hmm. just went all over the place sorry <laughs> <laughs> that's okay that's okay there's definitely been different waves and generations that have affected the studio for better or for worse and yeah it just keeps changing as the the technology changes the people the the leadership as you were describing yeah everything just continues to change and for you you've made that big change of you've moved to a different part of the Walt Disney company and you've worked for TV i remember hearing far back that you were working on a feature film what happened that led you to make the move to television to work as a supervising director of Monsters at Work. Mm. Uh, yeah. So it was, I, I didn't have a, 
Yeah, so I was in development for a long time at Features. Uh, Winnie the Pooh was 2011. I started pitching ideas in probably early t- 2012 uh, to John Lasseter. Uh, got one accepted in 2013. Then five years later, in summer of 2018, we finally got to a first draft of a script after five years of development that um, kind of crashed and burned. And uh, I, I just realized I had hit my emotional limit. Like I was, I was really, um, I totally loved the project, but after all that time, I had just lost my compass for it. So um, I decided to step away from it and, uh, and look for other opportunities. And then this opportunity came up and I thought it's great because I, I uh, I've already worked with and am, and am friends with leadership of the show, so I know them. It's also a chance to get in really early with Disney Plus and kind of see what that's all about. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's like just a super fun world. The Monsters Inc. world is just like how can you not have fun with that? It's you know, uh, so it was like wow, there's nothing negative about this. <laughs> uh, so I decided to go ahead and make the make the leap, mm-hmm. and it's been a blast. Fantastic! Uh, Monsters yeah. Inc. is definitely one of my favorite Pixar worlds and stories for sure. So I've I was really excited to see that they were going to make it a TV show, and I'm glad that yeah. it's been going well so far, <laughs> leading up yeah. to when it releases next year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I will say. Prior to getting there, I think I know the move, the shows had a, a, a had a couple uh, uh, speed bumps in its way, so it had been going for a while. I know it was it was it was tr- having trouble finding its footing, but we've got a great a great cast of new characters, uh, super fun idea. It's it's currently just going to be a ten episode um, little story arc for now, and then we'll see what happens after that. But but it's. The, the team is amazing. The characters are just super fun. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying myself too much. <laughs> oh, well, that's good to hear, especially after that long development process that you were under. It's, it's glad I'm glad to hear that you're in a better place now and being able to work on something that you're having a lot of fun doing. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, uh, d- developing something you know original is really awesome and and a, an amazing opportunity to get uh but it was it was great to be to like hit the ground running and and be making something the day i stepped into the studio it's like it was going mm-hmm. we're making a show so get on the train and let's <laughs> go <laughs> and yeah. uh and that's been just great because uh, it's nice just to kind of be back in the saddle again sure so where do you see your journey going next? What do you hope that you'll still get to accomplish in your career? Um, I, I think I've, I've, I just want to keep making stuff uh, and become a better director. That's sort of my, that's sort of really the extent of my ambition. I don't, I've never really had any ambition to like, I want my own studio or I want to, you know, whatever. I, I, I just love telling stories. Uh, I love working with artists and and te- technology folks and smart people that are really driven and passionate. And I've been so lucky to have gotten to do that up to this point. And I look forward to doing that more. And I like collaborating with people and and putting a story together. And uh, and I just want to keep doing that and get better at doing it. Sure, that's really. That's really what I, I hope to be able to continue to do. Absolutely. And I wish you all the best of luck doing that. Finally, Steve, I want you to tell the listeners what you feel is the number one piece of advice that would help them follow their dreams. Uh, I would say the number one piece of advice uh, for me is uh, collaboration. And that can that means a lot of different things, but but certainly in animation in the film business in any kind of creative endeavor um being able to collaborate being able to listen uh being able to uh, listen to feedback 
being able to give feedback in a constructive way, um, being able to uh, listen to someone's idea and build on top of it in that collaborative sort of yes and feeling that we often get in story rooms and story development sessions. Um, the, certainly in animation, you don't make it alone unless you're making your own little film on your laptop at home, and that's great. But for the most part, if you're working in the industry, you're working with a, a large number of people. And the only way you're going to get anything done is to collaborate and to listen and to certainly as a leader, um, remove fear from the process so that people can feel free to say anything, to suggest anything, to um, contribute however they can. Um, and you just get a better collaborative environment that way. So I think being open to to that kind of collaborative spirit um, is, is what I would say. Fantastic. Yeah, work as a team, build together, create something amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Steve. It's been an absolute pleasure to be able to talk to you today. Oh, thanks, Isaac. I appreciate the invitation. I've really enjoyed it. I, I appreciate it. Well, yeah, thank you very much. It, it was a lot of fun to be able to hear about your story. To all of you who are listening, if you enjoyed this discussion, let me know by telling someone about the show, rating the podcast, and subscribing. Also, it would mean a lot if you followed my Disney adventures and discussions over on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at Watso Videos, and considered supporting the show by donating on Patreon and purchasing the Following Dreams merchandise, which will also be linked below. To all of you fun people who are out in the world, thank you so much for listening, and have a magical day.